Okay, everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, I think uh, anybody who knows my work is probably suspecting I'm going to say that uh, what's next is uh, poverty measurement. <laughs> but I'm not. Um, we face very unequal challenges ahead in terms of, uh, particularly in research, but also very much on policy. And inequality, addressing inequality is, in my view, the greater challenge going forward. There are two main reasons. One is that you know, we have this powerful instrument of economic growth for absolute poverty reduction. I emphasize absolute poverty reduction. Uh, but inequality, not so clear. In fact, roughly the, half the time in growing economies, <coughs> inequality increases. Half the time, it decreases. Um, much less powerful for inequality. There's also, um, broad, while there's broad agreement today that we want to eliminate poverty, that's not the case for inequality. We don't have that kind of consensus, anything like that kind of consensus. So my question today is, should and, and can that change? Um, this is all an extension of an a op-ed I wrote in, in Le Monde um, last year, and, um, basically addressing that question. Okay, the motivational challenge. Why should we care about inequality? I'm going to review that. Um, and the policy challenge. What do we do about it? How, um, what are the constraints? Uh, what, are the, what do we know already? And what do we need to know going forward? Why do we care? Um, first thing, let's get this cleared up. We, you know, zero income inequality is definitely not the goal. I don't think anybody could defend that very easily. Um, we have all kinds of straw man arguments about class warfare, socialism, and so on. Um, I think we have to agree on a couple of things, that heterogeneity and the uh, ability of people to turn income into welfare is, is evident. Uh, that alone would mean, even within a utilitarian framework, that alone would mean uh, that we don't want uh, zero income inequality. Uh, we also recognize negative incentive effects uh, of, of very low earnings inequality. Uh, they get exaggerated, but they're there. Um, the concern really is about high inequality, countries that have very high levels of inequality or are getting there. Um, ethical arguments, the ethical objections are pretty clear, utilitarianism, as I mentioned already. A host of rights-based arguments, the, this, um, uh, the fight between utilitarian rights-based arguments goes back 200 years, as you probably know, but, um, and it's alive and well today. Issues of fairness in process, unequal opportunities, unequal outcomes, unequal outcomes when they foster unequal opportunities in the future. The specific inequalities uh, all carry weight. What's really new is our knowledge of, and um, further work needed, but our knowledge of the costs of inequality in specific dimensions. But um, we've learned about the costs associated with credit and labor market failure, land market failure too. Uh, particularly hurting poor and uh, middle-class people. We've learned a lot about the political impediments to um, reform, economic reform and provision of public goods associated with uh, certain forms of inequality and the emergence of both left-wing and right-wing popularism is part of that story. Social costs of, of inequality are, are getting more attention. Uh, accumulated knowledge here, I think, pointing to a lot of concerns. It's not unambiguous. Some, some areas less clear than others. Um, we also, the fundamental thing, I guess from the point of view of poverty and social welfare more broadly, is, is how much harder it is to, to reduce poverty, promote social welfare in high inequality countries. Another point, although I said zero inequality is not the goal, certain kinds of inequality, zero is the goal. Certain between group inequalities, we want to be zero. Uh, certain within group inequalities, we don't. And that's quite important to note. So that the between group inequalities have a political salience and, a, and a motiva are motivators for action that within group inequalities uh, are not. Um, Ravi has pointed out in a few times how, how standard inequality decompositions uh, ignore this fact. Between group inequality can matter a lot more than we think in our standard economic measurements. Inequality of opportunity is another important area. We've seen arguments here going back to Aristotle, Aristotle's distributive justice, which is not the way we think of distributive justice today, if you read Aristotle, but the idea of uh, um, equality in the declaration of the, of the uh, rights of man and the citizen, which is the motto of France and the 
start of the, of the French Revolution. We also learned a lot about the lost output associated with inequality of opportunity. Counter arguments galore, and I'm just going to summarize a few of them and, and what I see is the, the, the case. Um, Arthur Lewis, development must be inegalitarian because it does not start at every part of the economy at the same time. Um, yeah, it's, it's, so, it's so intuitive, that statement, and, and, and very clear. But, but there are some qualifications. Um, we know that the distribution of the gains from growth um, depends in heavily on the initial distribution of endowments. It depends on the pattern of growth. There's all kinds of clear qualifications there and the important feedback effects, as I've mentioned. John Rawls, rising inequality is acceptable as long as the poorest are making progress. You know, I hear this so often uh, that um, pro pro poverty trumps inequality. Trumps, unfortunately, the word. Um, I've, got to f I've got to find another word. Anyway, um, the, uh, you know, Really, really a dubious claim in my view, although I'm a great fan of Rawls. If there's any philosopher, I, I turn to its Rawls. But um, we, a number of things, the dynamics of this, that high inequality can store future property reduction, even though things look fine now. Another issue we've, we've learned something about. And, and the measurement issues, you know, I do a lot of measurement, but if we, if we don't agree on who the poorest are, then this kind of perspective um, calls really for much broader distributional perspective, a distributional assessment. Arthur Young, you may not have heard of Arthur Young, but he was the first agricultural economist writing in 1771. And this is a, uh, epitomized, ca captures the um, incentive argument beautifully. Everyone but an idiot knows that the lower classes must be kept poor. They will never be industrious. And you've heard that today, haven't you? Some version of that. It's still around. It's, it was a majority view probably 200 years ago. It's a minority view now. Um, but the accumulated evidence, Arthur Young, people like David Ricardo, the greatest economist of his time and the greatest exaggerator of his time, uh, they, they had no evidence. We have the evidence now. We've learned a lot about incentive effects on labor supply, welfare programs, and so on. And accumulated evidence from people, um, many people, Bob Moffat, Ravi and his colleagues, Abhijit Banerjee and others. All of that is, 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 is true and clear. Um, incentive effects for at moderate marginal tax rates are pretty small. They're not zero, but it's not, it could easily get exaggerated. On the other hand, incentive effects at 100% marginal tax rates, benefit withdrawal rates in social policies that imply 100% marginal tax rates on poor people are, are really dumb. Uh, that's a bad idea. Um, perfect targeting is a horrible idea. Uh, how can we do better? Um, one aspect is, is better measures, measures to inform public debate. Um, I often go back to the issue of inequality of what that Amartya Sen has, has come back to often and reminded us of, reminded us of, reminded us of, of often. Um, we really do need to demonstrate the welfare relevance of the measures we use, and we don't do that enough. I think welfare is the anchor. Some concept of welfare is the anchor for everything we should do in, in poverty and inequality measurement. Um, I've always thought that the money metric approach is preferable. We've got a lot of advances in the money metric approach. I'm, I'm not a fan of multi-dimensional poverty and inequality indices, um, but we, you know, we can have that discussion. It's a good discussion. Um, I see much more scope for better money metrics of welfare. When, when, the fact that you measure poverty and inequality in a money space doesn't mean you think money is all that matters to people's welfare. That's nonsense. Um, it's how you measure money the money metric of welfare, how you map from welfare to money. Obviously, that's going to be contingent on many factors. Um, the axioms of poverty and inequality measurement, uh, some are pretty clearly acceptable, others are not. Um, scale independence axiom, as I, I mentioned in the talk yesterday, decomposability we've mentioned. Uh, another area is the, the evident lack of attention to what's happening to the poorest, and yet we see in social policy all the time emphasis on leave no one behind. You, you see that expression, read that expression a hundred times in the, in the sustainable development goals, for example, and in social policy generally. But we don't measure that. We don't measure the floor. We measure the portion of people below some poverty line or a distribution-sensitive poverty measure, but we don't look at how the poorest are doing. And when we do, in fact, it's looking not looking so good, that progress against absolute poverty is not coming with raising much progress in raising the, the floor, the lower bound. Not the biological floor, that should be below the actual floor, but, but 
the, the actual lower bound of the distribution of consumption or income. Yeah, thanks. Uh, better evidence we need uh, on, on all of this in terms of policy. The measurement concerns that I, 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 I've touched on already. Um, what does the evidence suggest? You know, it's not, it's not real good. Roughly a third of, of the poorest, um, um, about a third of the, of the poorest quintile globally are not receiving any help from any direct form of direct intervention, including the interventions that uh, claim to be helping them. We've got roughly one billion people living in poverty. We've got roughly one billion people receiving some form of help today in the developing world. It's just a different billion. They don't overlap that much. Current social protection policies, this is broad picture, but in globally current social protection policies are raising the floor of about 50 cents a day. Almost all of that is through social insurance. Social assistance is raising the floor in the world today by about 1.5 cents a day on average. Um, spend more on social policy. You have more impact on the, on the lowest level of living, on the, on the poorest people in the world. Uh, it's largely, the variance is largely to do with how much you spend. It's not about how you spend, but it should be a lot to do with how you spend. Um, challenging constraints, and the, well, here I just want to mention going forward, uh, we know a lot of the constraints pretty well, and I mentioned the, the obvious ones here, budgets, incentive effects, political economy. Um, but there's one not so sexy constraint, information, that I think is, is absolutely crucial and is under, undervalued. Um, there's some recent evidence of a series of papers that I've done with Kate Brown and Dominic van der Waal is here, where we've been trying to really quantify the information constraint, um, working particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, but uh, it's pretty alarming. Uh, here's one little gem from it. Um, even with a budget sufficient to eliminate poverty with perfect targeting, not something a policy I recommend, as I said already, but even if we had enough money to, bring every, uh, to eliminate poverty in sub-Saharan Africa, the, with the information we actually do have, the targeting methods we actually do use, we're going to leave about three quarters of the poor untouched. Our, our data, our instruments for targeting, and all the both information requirements and incentive effects, put it all together, it's not looking real good, um, in, particularly in low-income countries. It's kind of a cruel irony. The poorer the country, the less effective we are today. Uh, and that's a huge challenge going forward. Um, there is a new role, I believe, for redistributive interventions, but they, they've got to be, uh, I think, much smarter than the ones we talk about now. There, there are no magic bullets here. You're going to have to adapt. We're going to have to worry about all the concerns I've talked about, incentive effects, behavioral responses. Behavioral responses are on one side of the debate. Behavioral responses are greatly exaggerated, as I mentioned, the example of Ricardo. Um, on the other side of the debate, Ricardo's uh, representatives of Ricardo are alive today saying the same thing. On the other side of the debate, behavioral effects are, are entirely ignored, incentive effects are ignored. And that doesn't make a lot of sense. It's, it, there's a middle ground that's missing. Um, one option I keep emphasizing, I'm not an unconditional fan of any policy, but I think going forward we're going to have to think more seriously about untargeted, more universal provision in poor countries. When this country was very poor, as poor as uh, probably any country in sub-Saharan Africa today, um, social policy emerged, also particularly in Sweden, nearby. Um, and it, they didn't start with finely targeted, administratively costly, sophisticated interventions, exactly the things we're recommending in low-income countries today. They started much more universal, basic health and education. They were less ambitious because they knew they couldn't do it. And yet we're telling low-income countries all over the world that the, they, they, should, they can and should be finely targeting their interventions. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So UBI, universal basic income, should be the benchmark. I think in many countries we can do better than universal basic income, and I think it should be universal full basic income, not just income, including imputed values for in-kind services, so we fold in the issues about universal health care and education. Um, that should be the benchmark. If we can't do better than that, fine. In most low-income, middle-income countries today, we, we, we aren't doing better than universal basic income. But universal basic income would do a better job now, 
if you're asking me, should you do a UBI in, say, um, France, I'd say, no, doesn't make sense. But in a lot of countries, it, it makes more sense. So keep it on the menu. These are my conclusions. I think I've said all this. We need well-informed debates on the intrinsic and instrumental case. We need sensible policy interventions and proposals um, for both pro poor growth and redistribution. Stop focusing on targeting as the objective in, in all of this. Focus on the distributional outcomes. And, and of course, policy-relevant monitoring and evaluation, learning from our mistakes. Thank you.